In the last few years, I've developed a taste for culling. You wouldn't know it to look at me, but I love to cull. In the last year, I culled 100 board games from my collection. I went from 320 games to 220 games. And it was partly to make space for my new baby, although I've since learned they can't sleep in a Kallax. But really, I just wanted those games gone. So in this video, I'm going to tell you every game I got rid of, why I didn't want it anymore, and which games I'd rather play instead. And for those substitutes, I'll put links to my older videos and where you can buy them in the description. These are all games that at some point I decided, this is good, I want to keep this game. And some I've had for eight years or more. And most of them are still good. I still like them, I just don't love them anymore. I wouldn't write a song about them. Well, not another one. Weird some wages, dumb moon lords of Vegas, time story, so run into Vega Fungi. Pause fever, sabotage, garden, let's flip in an island in RBCV. I split it up into categories. First up is games with too much faff. It could be rules, setup, admin. I don't want a game to feel like work. Even though, get your tiny violins ready. For me, they all are. Robinson Crusoe Adventures on a Cursed Island used to be in my top 50 games. It's a deeply thematic cooperative game about surviving on a deserted island. And to achieve that theme, it's full of rules intricacies and tokens to track a million different things. And I used to almost love that, that it could simulate its world so well by making every decision have thematic consequences. But now I'm tired of it. Every time I go back to it, I'm having to check the rulebook to remember it all. And I'm finally on board with everyone who says it's too punishing. The game never gives you hope, just misery. And whilst it might be thematic, it grinds you down. It hurt to let this one go. I've had it for nine years. But now, if I want a co-op game that tells a story, I turn to Dead of Winter because it manages to be tense, but with less faff. Although it's not exactly faff-free. Junker is a stunningly beautiful dexterity game with gorgeous wooden pieces that inspire creative stacking. And it's divided into 10 mini-games with cards and point tokens and all different rules. And it's all very clever, but I've realised it's more than I want from a stacking game. This type of game doesn't need loads of variability. I'd rather keep it simple and play Catch the Moon. I love the theme of Flashpoint Fire Rescue. A house is on fire, and you play as firefighters trying to save the victims. But it's got so much admin. At the end of every turn, the work required to make the fire spread is just too much. And there's not enough room for clever play. You take the obvious move most turns. Which for me is what sets Pandemic apart from this and most other co-op games. Kitchen Rush and Rush MD are both real-time cooperative games. One set in a restaurant and the other a hospital. You have sand timers which act like your workers. If you put some food in the oven, you have to wait for it to cook before you can use that worker to do something else. They're really frantic, talkative games that do a great job of feeling like a stressful kitchen or hospital. To deliver that feel, there's a lot going on. Loads of components to lay out and rules to teach. It's not that much, but it's more than I want from a real-time game, a genre which I've fallen out of love with in recent years. I'd love to play these games at someone else's house, where they set it up and run it, and I just sit there eating the banoffee pie they made for us, while listening to their playlist that has the occasional good song, but just isn't as good as the kind of stuff I play at my place. At home, I'll stick to a much simpler real-time game with sand timers, called Kites. Anirim is a solo or two-player card game that feels like solitaire but with more control. And like a million people have said about this game before, you have to do way too much shuffling. And after the honeymoon phase ends, it doesn't feel worth the effort. I'd rather play the app version, but they didn't update it on Android, so I can't. I don't have anything like Anirim anymore, but it's not something I'm missing. Not a day goes by that I'm not taking turns of Memoir 44 on Board Game Arena. It's my favourite game to play on there. But I got rid of my hard copy long before I started playing it online because in real life it's a lot of work. Setting up those maps is fun once, putting out your toy soldiers. But after that it's just admin. And trying to remember all the terrain and unit rules is impossible. And then in return for all that work, you get a game that is just way too lucky for my taste. The dice are one thing, but 
not getting the cards you need is painful. And on top of all of that, I just don't have the opportunity to play long two-player games. So if I was in the mood for a war game, I'd play 878 Vikings, which is two versus two. Pictomania is a party game in which everyone is drawing and guessing at the same time. You secretly vote on what someone else is drawn, and the earlier you vote, the more points you get, so everything's a rush. It's chaotic fun, and I still love playing it, but it's annoying to run a game of it. There's a few too many things to remember for a late night party game. And since my friend Becky always brings it out, she can run it instead. Top tip, don't own a game if you can play someone else's copy. In my collection, I've kept Doodle Rush, which is a much simpler and even more frenzied drawing game. Dungeon Fighter is a very silly cooperative dexterity game that has you throwing dice onto a target to kill monsters. It's like playing darts with dice. And to make it hard, you'll have to throw your dice with your eyes closed or while spinning around or blow them off your elbow. And I like that silliness if I'm in the right mood, but I think I might be in that mood less than I was eight years ago. And the rest of the game is just admin. And even though they streamlined it in the new version, which I've tried, I'd rather get to the fun quicker with a simpler dexterity game. But I actually no longer own any flicking or throwing games. I've tried loads and none of them are worthy of my shelves. You can put your favorite flicking game in the comments, but I promise you I've tried them and I was disappointed with them and with you. Bad Company is a dice game inspired by Catan and Machi Koro about gangs trying to complete heists. I much prefer it to Machi Koro, even Space Base, because it has more reason to care what the other players are doing, but there's just so many pieces, it feels fiddly to set up and to play, and the luck of which gangsters you draw is disappointing. Instead, I've kept my farm shop, which is more streamlined and has this fun supply and demand dynamic that makes it exciting. These next games are great, except for one fatal flaw. When I'm in the mood for culling, I stand in front of my shelves like a farmer surveying their herd, looking for imperfections. One dodgy mechanism is enough to send them to the meat grinder. Cartographers is a flip and write game in which you're all drawing maps, trying to arrange your forests and towns in such a way to please the queen. It's an engrossing personal puzzle as the objectives pull you in different directions and you try desperately to make it all work. The thing that I've grown to hate about it are the monsters that spoil your perfect map and distract from an already hard enough challenge. They're drawn onto your map by another player as an attempt to add interaction to a pretty solitary game, but they're just annoying. I love interaction in games, but this feels so crowbarred in for the sake of it that it's worse than having none at all. I'd rather be left alone in Railroad Inc. instead. Watson and Holmes is a crime solving game with a Sherlock Holmes theme, but the difference with this one is it's competitive. You're racing against the other players to visit locations, read the encounters and find the solution. It's actually a really well designed game. You're bidding to drive faster to meet suspects before other players and blocking them from getting vital information. And the cases are really well written, but it just feels lonely. You're making notes on your own, never really talking because you don't want to share information. I'd just rather play a crime solving game cooperatively and Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective is just that with the same theme. Paperback is a deck building word game. You create words which let you buy new letters to add to your deck so you can build longer, better words in the future. It's a brilliant game that I love playing on the app, but in real life, it feels like playing a solo game at the same table. I'm so fixated on my own hand and I wanna take more time than is reasonable to craft the perfect word, which is a flaw with all word games. I love the challenge of coming up with long words but I get caught up by a naive arrogance that I can use all the letters when it's actually impossible. Perhaps the flaw is with me, but Paperback was the last word game to leave my collection because it was the best. Quadropolis is a city building game that does many things right. I like having to plan the layout of my city to get houses next to parks. I like having to balance the population and the energy needs of my city, but there's not enough reason to care what the other players are doing. Instead, I've kept Capital, which has all that city building goodness, but with the added motivation of trying to do better than your rivals 
to win special buildings each round. One of my more ruthless cullings, I must have been out for blood this day, was Long Shot the Dice Game, a game about betting on a horse race that packs a lot of game into a small box. With one fatal flaw, you can pull the horses back in the race to stop them from winning, and it happens so often that it massively prolongs the length of the game and turns a photo finish into a photo fizzle. When I got rid of it, I was thinking that Camel Up would take its place, but I played that again recently, and it might be due a cull itself. There was a lot to like about On the Underground, in which you build tube lines and try to attract passengers to use them. I love the theme, I love the shared board that you're trying to steal custom from each other, but what killed it for me in the end was the downtime. Trying to solve the puzzle each turn grinds the train to a halt. It means the game doesn't flow nicely, and that's enough to lose a spot on my shelves. For train route building, I've always got Ticket to Ride Europe instead. Hanamakoji is a head-to-head -head two player card game. You're trying to win the favor of the geishas by having their favorite items which is a theme that does nothing for me, but I kept it for the gameplay, which is full of tough decisions. But I went off it because it goes around in circles. It's a zero sum game. You win what I've lost and I win what you've lost. And it feels like no progress has been made. Everyone's just swapped seats. I'd much rather play Air, Land and Sea where each round builds towards the finish. Portal of Heroes is an underrated German card game that packs a lot into a tiny box. You're trying to collect the right sets, a bit like Ticket to Ride, to unlock heroes which give you powers building your engine as you race to finish first. Its fatal flaw is that it doesn't have any text on the card, so you have to constantly check the rules leaflet to understand your powers. I find that so annoying that I'd rather banish it from my collection than put up with it. And then sulk because I don't have another game like it. The next batch of games are what I'd call too fragile. They're temperamental. One day you might have a brilliant time, another you could get a complete dud. I used to keep loads of these sorts of games, fixated on that one memory of when it was incredible, or the dream of what you know the game can deliver. But now I haven't got the patience. There's too many consistently good games out there to wait for a fragile game to be in the right mood. Escape from Aliens in Outer Space is a hidden movement game with hidden roles. Half the players are humans trying to escape, and the others are aliens trying to hunt them down. And every time you move, you announce your location. But sometimes it's a lie and sometimes the truth. The game can create tense chases where you don't know who is who, but more often I've had people get eliminated far too quickly, and confusion and mistakes mean players give their role away by accident. I'd rather just play a normal hidden movement game like Sniper Elite. Spyfall is a clever social deduction game where all players are told which location they're in, such as a circus, but one player, the spy, has no idea. You then ask each other questions, trying to find out who the spy is, while the spy tries to work out which location they're in. I love this game in theory, but it's so hard to hint to your teammates that you know the location without giving it away. Or if the spy gets asked a question early on, they usually get caught because they're clueless. It's also just really hard thinking up questions and answers on the spot, and one tiny slip of the tongue can spoil the game. I found myself playing round after round of this recently, waiting for the perfect game, and never quite having it. I find this dynamic of one person in the dark works better in Where Words, where it becomes a game of 20 questions, and A Fake Artist Goes to New York, where you lie through your drawings. I can't actually bring myself to get rid of Battlestar Galactica, but I'm including it because I know I should. For a long time, it was a 10 out of 10 game for me. It's an epic hidden traitor game inspired by the TV show in which some players are secretly Cylons trying to sabotage the crew from within. It's the perfect theme for a near perfect game but it's so fragile. You can go half the game without a traitor and win with ease, or have the same player be given both traitor cards so they have no chance. And there's a lot of rules and a lot of admin, especially when you use the expansions, which I also have. I've since played Unfathomable, which streamlined the game with a different theme, but it still felt too fragile to me. And BSG is out of print and hard to come by, so if I sell it, I'm never getting it back. 
and I want so desperately to relive the great games I've had, but it's been so long I question whether they were actually any good. Like looking back at a dodgy haircut you were convinced looked amazing at the time. Villa Paletti is a Spiel de Jahres winning dexterity game in which you collectively build a towering villa with pillars. In each turn, you remove a pillar of your colour from the lowest story and place it higher up. You're trying to get your colour as high up the tower as possible and not get trapped underneath. It's a bit on the nose to call a stacking game fragile, but I find that people are so desperate to win that they take out vital supports and collapse the tower before it ever reaches the impressive heights that you'd hoped for. It's a fun idea that I just don't think works in practice. For an epic stacking game, I'd rather place cargo on a rocking pirate ship in Riff Raff instead. These next games I got rid of because they were too long. But I've kept games that last much longer than these, it's just for the type of game, the experience I'm getting, it doesn't warrant its length. Like a film that stretches out a 90 minute story to two and a half hours, it spoils your enjoyment of even the good bits. Broom Service is the game I feel I'm most likely to regret getting rid of. It has this amazing bravery mechanism that I've not seen in another game. When you reveal a card, you decide whether to be brave or cowardly. If you're brave, you get more stuff, but if someone else has picked that card after you and decides to go brave, you get nothing. Whereas being cowardly guarantees you'll get something. It's full of big reveals and frustration when you make the wrong call. But there's a few too many rounds of that same thing, especially in a game where luck plays a pretty big role. There is a shorter card game version, but that's nowhere near as good. In the end, I'd rather play Isle of Sky, which is another quirky interactive game from the same designer. Some games you look at on the shelf and the thought of playing them is exhausting, and Fury of Dracula was one of those. I've never played a game of it that lasted less than four hours. It's a hidden movement game where one person is Dracula and everyone else is hunting them down. And my overriding memory of it is having my head in the rule book. I love that it exists, I'm happy to have played it, but I can't imagine ever going back to Drac. And if I want an overly long hidden movement game, I've still got Letters from Whitechapel, which doesn't keep throwing new mechanisms at me to understand. Lockup is set in a fantasy prison. You're trying to outdo your rivals by sending stronger gang members to locations to win resources. You have to judge how to spread out your gang based on what you think your opponents will do, because some are played face down. And I love that challenge, but I think it would work better in a shorter, simpler game with a few less ideas going on. There were times this game felt an hour too long, which means it dominates a game night, and I don't think it's worth that. But sadly, I don't have a good alternative to it either. Thunder and Lightning is a two-player card game of Norse mythology, Thor versus Loki. You play cards that act like your battlefield, you're trying to use your powers to wipe out the other player or find their gold ring. I really like the way you play cards face down and lay traps for your opponent, but the arc of the game is too long, there's a lot of build up and repetition before you reach the climax, and that length makes the luck of the draw feel more annoying. I'd rather play a shorter head to head two player card game like Shot and Totten. Zombicide Black Plague is a cooperative game of zombie survival that in some ways is nice and streamlined. The player boards help you track your character and your weapons. And the game has a really nice teamwork feel with planning how to tackle the horde of zombies and get to your objectives. But it's just so long, and the admin of replenishing the zombies gets tiresome. I'd love a tight, streamlined version of a game like this, but the publisher's temptation to make endless money on Kickstarter with additional content means it'll never happen. I love a hidden movement game, and Spectre Ops used to be one of my favourites. One player is moving in secret around a map, trying to hit secret objectives, while the other players work together to catch them and kill them. Which is the exact same description for Sniper Elite the board game that manages to do it in half the time, and with a better approach to weapons and special powers. Speculation is a stock market game from 1992, which I'd originally liked because of how streamlined it felt, in that classic German style. You influence the market by picking a company card each round to move and then buy low and sell high. 
But sadly, the rounds become very repetitive. It feels like you do the same thing about 50 times before getting to the end. For a shorter, more interesting stock market game, I'd go for the rich and the good instead. Biblios is considered by many to be the ultimate filler game. And I've always liked its signature drafting mechanism. You take a card off the deck and decide where to assign it before you draw the next card. So if you keep it, you're banking on the next card not being even better. It's always a fun decision, but the rest of the game isn't as exciting to me, and it drags. With the unpredictable values of the colors and minuscule point differences, I've lost interest by the end. I'd rather play a quicker auction game with more drama like High Society. These next games are simply not my kind of thing. It's taken me years to learn my own taste, and with these games, I kept them for so long because I like the idea of them more than the experience itself, like forcing myself to keep eating olives until I found what everyone else was enjoying. But to betray anyone that was relating to me there, I do actually like olives. I just don't like these games. This game, Azul, is not in my board game collection, but it is on the same bookcase as my board game collection. Let me explain. As a reviewer, I've granted myself special permission to keep games for professional purposes that I don't consider to be part of my collection. For example, to make my 10 Reasons Board Games Are Better Now video, I needed copies of Monopoly and Game of Life, which I couldn't possibly allow into my collection, so are now part of the actual LOL historical archives. Same shelves, different remit. Much in the same way that I'm exempt from having a shelf of shame, because any games that I haven't played are simply research materials. Azul is fine. I don't get enough from it for it to be anywhere near my collection. Figuratively, it is physically very near. It's got the personal board of something like Sagrada or Cascadia, but without their fascinating puzzle. And it's interactive, but it's not nearly as interactive as people make out. Brewcrafters is a worker placement game that I had because I love the theme of brewing beer. You send out your workers to collect the ingredients you need and use them to brew ales and stouts and porters. And there's loads of thematic details, like you can build a brew pub to sell your beer quicker. But underneath it all, it's a heavy Euro game. And I played it for the last time recently, and I won, but it felt like doing admin. I was totally focused on my own engine for two hours. And that's just not the experience I play board games for. I'd always go for something lighter like Champions of Midgard. Fog of Love is a two-player storytelling game where you play as a romantic couple. I love romantic comedies, and I love so many things that this game tries to do, but I didn't enjoy the role-playing. It always feels forced in a board game, like performing for your friends to prove that you're fun. Whereas in an actual role-playing game, it feels more natural because it is the game, not a sideshow from it. Or maybe that's just a roundabout way to admit that I'm not fun. I also worked for the company that made Fog of Love back in 2018, so it became a busman's holiday for me. Sleuth is a classic deduction game from the 70s. You have to work out which is the missing gem by asking each other questions about the gems they have in their hand. It's a solid design that really taxes the brain, possibly the best deduction game I've ever played, but I just don't find them fun. It feels like doing school homework. I'd much rather play any crime solving game that rely on a different part of your brain like Chronicles of Crime. And it's the same story for MS Battery, which is a family-friendly deduction game set on a 3D cruise ship. I love its Agatha Christie vibes and light rules. I prefer it to Sleuth because it's less intense, but it's still the same staring at a piece of paper that I can't get on with. For a murder mystery that doesn't feel like homework, I really like Paranormal Detectives, which is a much sillier game. King Domino is a similar story to Azul. It's perfect for beginners, but just not exciting enough for me. I really respect the design. You're adding domino tiles to your personal map, trying to score areas, but there's not enough reason to care what anyone else is doing. And as a minor complaint, I hate that you can screw yourself over and arrange your grid so that you can't complete it. That's just not newbie, or in my case, idiot friendly at all. I'd much rather build a map together in Carcassonne. The next category are games that are hard to hit the ground running with. I want to have fun in the very first game, and I'm always playing with different people, so there's always someone new to the game, and 
I hate watching them struggle to understand it, especially if it's the kind of game that impacts everyone else if you're totally lost. Hanabi is an iconic cooperative card game in which you can see everyone else's cards but your own, and you're limited in how you can communicate to each other. To be good at Hanabi takes practice and benefits from playing with the same group, which I never have. Plus, my wife won't play it because she hates letting the team down if she forgets her cards, and it falls apart if you play with anyone prone to some soft cheating, which is quite a lot of people I've found. And whilst I enjoy it, that's just too many hurdles to overcome to be worth keeping around. So I'd rather play Order Overload Cafe, which is a co-op memory game that is much easier to grasp and less embarrassing for the weaker players. The Crew, Quest for Planet Nine, is a similar story. This one is a cooperative trick-taking game in which you can't communicate. New players really have to learn from their mistakes in this game, and I find it boring sitting through that with every new group. Plus, players can be made to feel guilty for playing the wrong card, which can be infantilizing and awkward to witness. I'd rather play The Mind, where your mistakes are much more forgivable. I'll be honest, the reason that I kept Hive was because you could take it and play it anywhere. It's waterproof, you can play it on sand, sort of, and it would survive a fire, probably. And in a fantasy scenario where I'm some kind of board gaming Bear Grylls, that would be perfect but I spend my holidays in bars and restaurants, which have even more dry, not on fire tables than I have at home. It's a two player abstract game in which you use your insect pieces to try and surround your opponent's queen bee. It's the sort of chess like game that needs to be practiced to be good at. And in the 12 months between holidays, we always feel like we're starting from square one with it. For me and my wife, we struggle to look past Onitama. And it's a very similar story for Tack, an abstract game that lured me in with its carved wooden pieces and cloth board so you can play it in a forest atop a tree stump. Which sounds magical, but is actually an act of aggression to play with chopped up bits of wood on top of a dead tree. And like Hive, Tack takes a while to get going and the strategies are too opaque for my liking. Vault Wars is a card game inspired by the TV show Storage Wars. The idea is that when fantasy heroes die, you get to auction off the loot that they've left behind. And I love the conceit of this game, that you can see some of the stuff that you're bidding on, but not all of it, so you can end up with junk and cursed relics. But for such a fluffy idea, there's a few too many things going on that mean you can struggle in that first game. And it's also not as streamlined as I'd like, and outstays its welcome. For auction card games, I'd play for sale instead. Crosstalk is a wonderful word guessing party game that is a twist on catchphrase. Both teams are trying to guess the same word, and the clue givers must give vague clues because the other team has the chance to guess first. But the trouble is, it's really hard to judge how vague you need to be in your first game or two, so the whole group ends up with a dud experience until everyone gets it. I love the challenge of this game, but only after everyone has warmed up to it, and that's just too demanding for a party game. And sadly for Crosstalk, the very similar Phantom Inc came along and doesn't suffer from the same problems. The Grizzled is a cooperative card game in the vein of Hanabi and the crew. You play as World War I soldiers trying to survive the horrors of the trenches and keep morale up. You can't communicate, so to be good you have to learn from failure by letting your team down. And it would be fun to go through that journey together with the same people. But for me, it's like having to start watching the TV show from the first episode every time someone new joins. And the game just isn't interesting enough to be worth that way. Master Word is a party game that combines words and the deduction game Mastermind. The seekers write clues onto whiteboards and the guide tells them how many are on the right track, but not which ones. So it's a process of deduction trying to get to the answer and it's really hard to know what to write. Even after playing it 23 times, I don't know, which is a little disconcerting. And as the guide, it's fun watching them struggle, but you don't have enough to do. Frankly, it's too easily replaced by the master cooperative word game, Just One. These next games I realized are just a bit too hard. I love games that frustrate me, but these tip the balance into sapping my enjoyment because they frustrate more often than they reward. On Tour is a flip and write game about trying to plan a tour route for your band across the United States. 
You're trying to place numbers in order so you can draw a line through them continuously, but the dice constantly serve up chaos and your map becomes a graveyard to all the numbers that you couldn't put where you wanted. On a good day, it's a taxing puzzle with a really clean rule set, but other times it's just too painful to enjoy. But in general, I'd say I'm not the flip or roll and write lover I once was, so that didn't work in its favor either. But I do still enjoy Avenue for some root building that gets the frustration balance right. Shobu is a two player abstract game that won me over with its timeless aesthetic as you try to push your opponent's stones off the wooden boards. Rules wise, it's very simple, but I struggle to wrap my head around the consequences of my moves as I try to plan ahead. You're playing across four boards and the moves you make on one board are copied on another. It's a very cool idea that makes the game really special, but makes it even harder to process your options. Now I'm not a chess player and I don't enjoy feeling the need to spend that much time over my turns to succeed. So I'd rather play on Itama where I find it much easier to see ahead in the game. Overbooked is a personal puzzle game about trying to fit passengers onto an aeroplane. It's effectively a Tetris game. You take a card which gives you a layout of passengers to seat on your plane in that formation. You're trying to sit them in a way that keeps everyone happy to score points. Lovebirds want to be in pairs and the rugby players want to be in a big group. I love the theme of this one and the artwork is really cute as well. It's just too hard. The cards give you such complicated arrangements that it's really hard to ever fit them in and feel good about what you've done. It gives everyone analysis paralysis because you're so desperate to make it work. Each card feels like a punishment that you have to accept. You're never excited to find the perfect shape like in most Tetris games. I'd rather play Spring Meadow, which does let you feel good about yourself. This next batch are games where their gimmick has worn off. Something stood out about them that initially pulled me in, but over the years, it's lost its charm, which is why you should never marry a magician. And because they're weird. Between Two Cities was the first game to use the mechanism of sharing with the players sitting to your left and right. You are building two cities collaboratively by drafting tiles. Now, I've since played three other games that use this mechanism, and I think that this game does it best. And while in theory, I love the idea of sharing, your success is dependent on your neighbors. So if you're sat next to the group's dullard, you won't win. And besides the gimmick, everything else is fairly dull, including some drab artwork. I'd sooner play a fully competitive city building game like Foundations of Rome. One Night Ultimate Werewolf is a twist on the classic hidden traitor game Werewolf. And this one plays in only 10 minutes. An app takes you through the night phase where characters will wake up and look at other roles. Then you have this big discussion where you try to work out who is who. And it's chaos because the only way to get information is for someone to tell the truth, but no one wants to tell the truth because it could put them at risk. And some roles have been swapped around so you don't even know who you are anymore. It's a blast, but it's fun because you're completely lost. And after loads of games of it, I feel like I've seen all it has to offer. And nowadays, I'd rather play a hidden traitor game with more to hold on to like The Resistance. There was a time that Time Stories was in my top 10 games of all time. It's a cooperative storytelling game that has you traveling back in time to explore a French insane asylum or an ancient Egyptian city. When I first played it, it felt so innovative, the way you explore the worlds that were rich with story. The earlier scenarios were a lot more fun than the later ones. There was too much focus on combat and fiddly dice rolling, and they kept experimenting with new mechanisms when all I wanted was interesting storytelling. I played eight scenarios, and by the end, I was done. Now, I'd rather play a mystery game, like The New Perspectives, which also asked players to describe what they can see to their teammates, something I loved about Time Stories. Looney Quest is an unusual game that tests your spatial awareness by having you draw lines on a perspex sheet, trying to navigate a map that you can see, but you don't get to put your sheet over until you've finished. You're trying to avoid obstacles and grab points. It's like playing a video game. And it's a fun challenge a few times, but that core gameplay hasn't kept me coming back to it, and it's probably better suited to kids. First Contact is a really clever game about humans making contact with aliens and trying to learn their language. The aliens have a language of symbols, and the humans will offer up items like a horse and a car to learn the symbol for fast. Then the aliens will send a message in their language to ask for the items that they need to win. I love the premise, and the first few games I was in love with its ingenuity, but beneath the surface, there's quite a lot of luck, and the humans 
don't really have much interesting to do. I'd rather play another team communication game like Word Slam. Masquerade survives some culls because it's small and it has the illusion of being more fun than it is. It's Chaos the card game. You must declare what role you have to use its power, except everyone is swapping cards so you can never be sure what card you have. And even when someone swaps, it could be a bluff. They could have kept them the same, but you don't know. There's so much memory required that you really have to focus, which just doesn't suit this kind of light social game. And I guess you can just let it flow over you and give in to the chaos, but then at that point you may as well just be playing Mousetrap. For this kind of role guessing card game, there's a reason that Love Letter has endured and Masquerade has died off. Color Brain is a trivia game where all the questions are about colors. So which five colors are in the Olympic rings? And then you have a hand of color cards and you have to pick your answers. I like it because it's really approachable, it's not too hard, and you can still just guess if you're not sure. But I don't find much room in my life for trivia games, and this is very one note. And that note doesn't tickle me quite enough. And as one note trivia games go, I enjoy guessing numbers in wits and wages a lot more. I used to be really excited to hunt down niche games that do something unique and unusual, but most of them are fun a few times and don't make you want to keep coming back to them. Like Igloo Pop, which is a kid's game that challenges your hearing skills. Each of the plastic igloos has a certain number of beads in it, and you have to shake them up to your ear and guess how many beads are in that igloo. It survived longer than most quirky party games in my collection, but I'd rather play something like Shifty Eyed Spies and spend my evening winking instead of listening, which is also my dating technique. Picassimo is a drawing game, and it seems like there was a mass exodus of drawing games from my collection. I don't play them as much as I used to, my board gaming groups have changed. But in this one, you draw onto a whiteboard that is made of six sections. Then you shuffle those sections around, scrambling your drawing so it looks nothing like it was intended. The guessers have to look at it and work out what it was. I really like that challenge on its own, but the game itself is a bit sedate, and I get way more laughs out of a game of Scrawl. The next games have too much luck for my taste. And it's not that I hate luck in games, I've got loads that are way luckier than these, but there's too much luck for the style of game they're going for. Mission Red Planet is an area control game where you send your astronauts up in rockets to control regions of Mars. It has a really fun mechanism of picking what action you'll do, all at the same time, so you're trying to anticipate what the other players will pick. What I don't love is that at the end of the game there are cards that get revealed which create massive point swings, and it's very hard to anticipate them. I'd rather play Libertalia Winds of Galecrest, which has a very similar action mechanism, but feels less swingy. Point Salad is a really popular filler card game in which you collect vegetables and point cards which score off certain vegetables. And those scoring conditions make you really want to consider every turn, which is great. But is it worth it when another player could get the perfect objective for their collection of carrots right at the end of the game and win by miles, but the equivalent card for your tomatoes isn't even in the deck in this game and you would have no idea. For a filler drafting game, I'd rather play Sushi Go, which doesn't trick you into thinking it's anything other than light and fluffy. Sunset Over Water is a pleasant little game about painting landscapes. You have to program your actions and hope that you'll get to locations that you want to paint so that you can sell your paintings before the other players. And I love the idea of trying to outthink your competitors, but I don't think there's much room for clever play when so much of it comes down to luck. I do still enjoy its sister game Herbaceous, which is a less ambitious but more satisfying push your luck game. Spirits of the Wild is a striking two player game that has you collecting gems to try and complete sets. You're trying to get the colors you need, but without giving your opponent what they want. It's got really tough decisions, that are undercut by the luck of the draw, and it can end really abruptly, which is unsatisfying. Plus, it's competing with too many great two-player options, like Sea Salt and Paper, which I absolutely love. The next games are ones that I just always rather play something else. And that's true of all the games in this video, but with these, there's a very specific game in my collection that makes it redundant. Pandemic The Cure is the dice version of Pandemic, and my first impression of it was how well it translates that game into something new but still familiar and fun. You roll dice to try and get the actions you need to treat diseases and find cures, 
and the way the disease is spread with the dice is really clever. But it's not much shorter than Pandemic, it's not smaller than Pandemic, and ultimately, despite being a brilliant game, Pandemic is just even better. Chinatown is the only game that's being replaced by itself. It's a brilliant game about setting up businesses in Chinatown, and it's one of the purest, most approachable negotiation games there is. But the trouble with every negotiation game ever made is that they're too long because you talk too much. And Waterfall Park, Chinatown's scarily bright reincarnation, is shorter. And it's much easier to build successful businesses, which makes it feel less punishing. I don't love the new look, but I do like the gameplay, and it will be easier to fit into Game Night. Codenames is my favourite game of all time, but Codenames Pictures is its poor younger brother living in its shadow. And I'm sure I'd have a great time hanging out with Luke Wilson, but also spend it wishing I was hanging out with Owen Wilson instead. Still fun, but not as fun. So if I'd always rather play Codenames, then I decided why not pass Codenames Pictures onto one of those weirdos who pretends it's the better game. Mysterium Park is a spin-off of the cooperative murder mystery game Mysterium, in which one player plays as the ghost, communicating who killed them and where to the other players by handing them Dixit cards. Mysterium Park does a great job of streamlining and downsizing the game, so it's quicker and easier to set up. And I actually can't fault it, but this is one instance where I prefer the spectacle and experience of the bigger game, despite the extra faff. And if I'm a ghost, I'd rather be murdered in a Scottish mansion than an amusement park. It's just a higher class of death. Muse is a team party game that also uses Dixit style cards. The clue giver is assigned a card that they have to get their teammates to guess, and each round you give clues in a different way, by making a noise, or naming a city, or humming a tune. And I like that variety of challenges in the game, but there's a lot of waiting around while the other team takes their turn. And ultimately, I had too many games with cards like this, and realised I prefer to play Stella instead. Ticket to Ride is a modern classic that everyone should play at least once. And its sister game, Ticket to Ride Europe, was my first modern board game 12 years ago. And I actually slightly prefer the original Ticket to Ride for its simplicity, but I decided I didn't need two versions of the same game because I don't play either of them that much, and I had to keep Europe for sentimental reasons. Balderdash is a classic party game from the 80s in which you write fake definitions for obscure words, hoping others will pick your fake definition. It's a format that works really well and has been copied loads of times. I own two games inspired by Balderdash, Ex Libris, in which you write first and last lines to famous novels, and Famous Last Lines, which is the same but for movies. And I'd rather play either of those than Balderdash, so it's wasted on my shelves. Wink is a brilliantly fun party game in which you must secretly wink at other players to win points, and try to catch other players winking at each other. And there's nothing especially wrong with Wink, but it was improved upon by Shifty-Eyed Spies, which runs a bit smoother and introduces two-way communication for an even tougher challenge. Hive Mind is the first party game I owned in which you must think like the Hive, i.e. write the same answers as other players to score points. And that core gameplay is always fun, finding out how your friends' minds work differently to yours. But Hivemind has a pointless board and all these extra rules that slowed it down. It's since been replaced for me by Herd Mentality, which is a much smoother experience. Space Cadet's Dice Jewel suffers from one problem, and that's that it's not Captain Sonar. Both are team versus team, real-time games, where you pilot ships and try to kill the other team's ship. And Space Cadets did it first, but Captain Sonar does it better. Both are quirky games that I would hardly ever play, so I can't keep them both. And Space Cadets is on the more chaotic side, it involves relentless dice rolling, it's harder to teach and to run. Whereas Captain Sonar is more elegant, plus it has this great hidden movement vibe. It's like the classic game Battleship, but for people with a brain. 13 Days Cuban Missile Crisis is a two-player card-driven game set in the Cold War that pitches itself as a shorter take on Twilight Struggle. It's push and pull as you try and control battlegrounds at the right time and I'd much rather play it than Twilight Struggle. But these days, I'd rather play another tug-of-war, two-player, historically-themed card game over 13 days, and that's Watergate. Trap Words is a really fun party game in which you're trying to get your teammates to guess certain words, but without saying the trap words. So it's like Taboo, but the twist is that you don't know what the trap words are, and the other team wrote them. 
So you're describing Jurassic Park, but without ever saying dinosaur or film or Spielberg, because you think that that's the type of trap word that they'd pick. It's such a great challenge. You're trying to talk, but you're terrified of every word you say. And I would still have that game, but it was replaced for me by band words, which is very similar, but easier to run. Trap words has some extra mechanisms that gives it more faff than a party game should really have. The next category are games that I have no one to play them with, either because it needs a massive group or it's just not the kind of game my friends are into. But to be honest, if I loved it that much, I'd stubbornly keep it anyway against my own advice. Two Rooms in a Boom is the ultimate big group social deduction game. You can play this game with anywhere from 8 to 30 players. And it's played across two rooms and everyone has a secret role. The blue team is trying to protect their president and the red team is trying to get the bomber in the room with the president to assassinate them. It's a game of discussion and bluffing and sending people between rooms and there's loads of different roles you can add in. It's kind of a fragile game, some go better than others, but it's only 10 minutes per game. And I haven't played it at home in years because it's best with huge groups. So it's great for playing at conventions, but I found that there's always someone else that brings it and runs it, so I don't need to own it myself anymore. Magic Maze and Magic Maze on Mars are two real-time cooperative games that you play in silence. You're trying to move your characters around a shopping mall, but to move them you have to work together because only one player can move them left, another moves them right, someone else controls up, and another down. So it really needs full concentration and great coordination to get it done in time. It's really fun with the right group, but it's hard to find the right group. One stress head will ruin a game of Magic Maze. And every time you lose, there's this debrief where you can't help but blame each other for what went wrong, which happens in most real-time co-ops, and I'm just kind of over that. It's a really brilliant game that I've had some amazing times with, but it's time for me to let it go. Dead Last is another big group social game, and I like this one because it felt really different. All the players are secretly voting to murder one of the other players, and the majority wins. So you're trying to create alliances and backstab people so that you will survive until the end. The game is really freeform. You can communicate to other players in any way you like. You could play it standing up, walking around a room. And it's a very mean game. It feels like being in a popularity contest, trying to be in with the cool crowd and not get picked on. And it works best with eight or more players, so it's really hard to find that many people who also want to play such a mean game. And if I did, I'd just use that opportunity to play Secret Hitler or The Resistance instead. This next batch has been axed for the simple reason that they're too big for what you get in the box. A game has to earn its space on my shelf, and the more space it's taken up, the more it needs to deliver. Tags is a party game which has you trying to think up things that fit a specific category and start with a specific letter. So if you need fruits that begin with S, you say strawberry. And your team is trying to shout out as many answers as possible in 15 seconds. I've played loads of games like this over the years and Tags is one of the best, but none of them have been addictive enough to keep coming back to like a really good party game. It's good for a family at Christmas, but it's a big box and it weighs a lot too. If I want a party game of shouting words that begin with certain letters, I'd go for Noggin, which is about 30 times smaller. Tapple is a very similar game to Tags, but this one has a special plastic contraption with a built-in timer. Every time you say a word, you press that letter down, eliminating it so that the options get smaller. And then you reset the timer in the middle, passing the hot potato to the next player. They have to shout an answer before the buzzer goes. And it's really fun for 10 minutes, but there's no depth there. And it takes up way too much space for something so simple. Terra and Fauna are trivia games that use a map of the world. You're given a famous landmark or species of animal, and you have to place cubes onto the board, guessing where in the world it is, or how big it is, or what year it was built. It's really adaptable in the sorts of questions it can ask. And you get points for being close with your guesses, which makes it feel not too hard. But to achieve all of that, there's a fair amount of admin with scoring, and they come in a massive box. And as much as I love a trivia game, they're more suited to a laid-back situation, which this doesn't fit, and something like Timeline works a lot better. Uluru is a real-time puzzle game that ties your brain in knots. Each round, the game gives you rules about how you can place the coloured pawns, so green can't be next to white, but white must be opposite orange. 
and you have to process them all and then arrange them against the clock. It's fun for a few rounds, but it's a pretty one-note experience that I could forgive from a card game, but it doesn't warrant a Ticket to Ride size box. Timeline Challenge takes the trivia game Timeline about guessing famous historical dates and introduces four new mini games to play with those cards, turning it into like a bigger game show experience. And they're fun, but not enough to warrant a massive box over Timeline's small tins. So I'll stick to playing those instead. The reason there's a lot of smaller, lighter games on this list is because when I used to cull my collection in the past, I found it easier to forgive a game that takes up less space. Not anymore. No game is too small for my sniper rifle. They're clutter. When I scroll through my collection on the board game Geek app, looking for something to play, they slow me down and get in my way. And these next games are so slight, so unassuming, that they may as well not exist at all. So now they don't. Similo is a cooperative party game that comes in many different decks of characters. Fairy tale, Greek gods, there's even a Harry Potter one. One player must communicate which is their secret character by playing other characters and saying that they're either similar or not similar to the secret one. It's impressively streamlined, but doesn't leave much room for creativity, and it results in quite samey cluing. For example, eliminating based on gender. I'd rather play Unusual Suspects, which creates more interesting discussions. Circle the Wagons is a tiny two-player card game that has one interesting mechanism. The cards are in a circle, and you can take further down the circle to get a card you want, but then you have to give the card that you skip over to your opponent. But the rest of the game is forgettable, using the cards as tiles to create connected areas of icons. I can't get excited for it over other two-player games I own, and I'd rather worry about what I'm giving my opponent in Sobek, two players instead. I always wanted to like the card game, the game, more than I did. It is the epitome of simple. You're trying to cooperatively get rid of your cards by playing numbers in order onto four piles. But it feels like it plays itself. You make the safest decision each turn and occasionally enjoy the luck of being able to jump a stack back by 10. I'd much rather the drama of trying to read each other's mind in the mind. These next games I've had for years, but honestly, I never needed to own them. There are so many games released like Ghost Splits. You flip a card and race to grab the right thing. Because let's be honest, they're easy to design. And Ghost Splits is probably the best of them all, but that's like owning the best Hanson album. And in both cases, there's no reason to play them. Although Penny and Me is a good song. I always had Railroad Ink Red and Railroad Ink Blue, but now I just have Blue. I don't need two versions of the same game, even if their expansion dice are different. It's inefficient and also just annoying to have two separate entries on Board Game Geek. Things like that bug me. Plus, Railroad Ink is so light, it's not the sort of game I want to experiment with loads of variants for. It's a nice filler. Some games shouldn't try to be more than that. And that goes for all of you Roll and Rights listening out there. Stop with your delusions of grandeur. You're just some dice and a bit of paper. You're not impressing anyone with those A4 spreadsheets and metallic whiteboard pens. The only reason I had Ticket to Ride London is because I live in London. It's a smaller, shorter version of the original game, which works, but is not as good. You need that longer arc to create tension over whether you'll complete your objectives and get routes ahead of your rivals. The London version is like a tiny chocolate bar. It gives you a good taste of the full experience, but it leaves you wanting more. And I'm not a collector. I can't keep a game just because I like the theme. This is a living collection. It only stays if it gets plays. I was delighted to find Faces in a charity shop almost a decade ago now. It's an early 2000s party game that Tom Vassell used to rave about. You get a lineup of photographs and you have to pick which face matches the description card. So who looks like they ate something sour? It's mildly amusing for a round, but there's just way too many better games like this. I'd rather play Stella, which is much better at sparking conversation. I kept faces for so long because it's hard to come by. I'd never be able to buy it again, but why would I want to? A rare game isn't a good game. Get them gone, stick them on eBay, and sell them to some schmuck who thinks that out of print is a badge of honor. But don't list them all at once, let's not make it a buyer's market. I kept Ohonami for years because I felt that I should like it more than I did. I was attracted by it packing a solid game into a tiny box. It's a card drafting game with simple rules 
but tough decisions. It's got more depth than something like Sushi Go, but it feels drier. There's no excitement with each card reveal. And when I visited Amsterdam, I was delighted to find that I could buy Sushi Go in the same sized box. A game that I got rid of because of Sushi Go Party, but couldn't resist a super portable version of. I used to think that it was useful to have an entry level card game like Cat Lady in my collection. It's a cute theme and it's good for teaching because all the options are out in the open. But I've since realized I've got better alternatives. There's actually a few more intricacies to teach than I'd prefer and I'd rather play Truffle Shuffle, which also has open drafting, but a bit more excitement or bring out something bigger like Sushi Roll. Aerion is a solo or cooperative two-player game in the same universe as Anirim. It's a dice game in which we're trying to roll poker-style sets like a full house or two pairs to win the cards you need. It's really tough, in a good way, but it just doesn't excite me. I can tell you why it's a well-designed game, but I can't tell you why I love it, because I don't. And I think that's how I feel about most little two-player co-ops because I haven't felt the need to keep any others either. These next games I don't play anymore, but I'd kept them because I could imagine playing them again one day. Yeah, if I win the lottery, I might be able to retire and pay people to play Twilight Imperium with me every day, but it also might not happen because I don't play the lottery. So instead of keeping games for a hypothetical future, I'll pass them on to another collection where they will get played. And maybe one day I'll buy them again if I need them or something better will come along between now and then and I'll get that instead. Coconut is a very silly dexterity game which involves flicking coconuts into plastic cups. It's beer pong for children. You each have a catapult and you win cups by getting your coconut in them. It's simple fun, but I don't feel compelled to play games like this as much anymore, but I can imagine it'd be great with kids when they're old enough to work the catapult. So like a lot of these, I might buy it again when my daughter's old enough. Sticky Chameleons is chaotic silliness in game form. The table is covered in cardboard insects and you each have one of those stretchy, sticky hands that you had as a kid where you fling it and it will stick to stuff. You're trying to use it to pick up the right insect token before everyone else. And it's brilliant how well it works because it's hard, but not impossible. And all the hands get tangled and you can even steal tokens off of each other. Everything goes everywhere, so it's really easy to lose tokens and the hands pick up fluff and dirt, but it's that sort of energetic burst of fun that can be great occasionally. But for now, I still have happy salmon for that. Ice Cool is another family-oriented dexterity game. You're flicking penguins around a school trying to catch each other. And the thing that sets it apart are the weighted penguin pieces, which you can flick to spin round corners and even make them jump over walls. You can make some incredible moves, which makes the game way more entertaining than your average flicking game. It's one of the best I've played, but it's hard to bring it out with adults because it looks so childish. And the box is bigger than I'd like. I'll definitely be buying this one again when my daughter's old enough. And in a similar vein, these are games that I once loved, but I just don't need that energy in my life anymore. Like going back to a video game from your childhood, you'd still have fun with it, but it'll never be as good as it was back then. And I'd rather move on to something new that suits who I am now. Escape Curse of the Temple is a great real-time cooperative game that has you all rolling dice at the same time, trying to get the results you need to move your adventurers through a temple get the treasure and get out before you die. It's stressful fun. You're desperately rolling and rolling. And I really like that your dice can get locked and your teammates will have to go back and save you. To be honest, talking about it now, I might miss it, but I just never feel in the mood for a hectic real-time game anymore. And it being so noisy means you can never play it in public. Ugtect is a ridiculous party game that involves bashing each other over the head with inflatable clubs. And to John of 10 years ago, that was music to his ears. Ears that were picking up frequencies I can only dream of now. You play on teams and try to communicate how to build a wooden structure using only caveman grunts. And if you make a mistake, your teammate hits you over the head. And it's fun. Of course it's fun. But it's also kind of intense. You can't just whip it out after a dinner at your friend's house. Not least because it weighs a ton. But not wanting to say goodbye to being hit by inflatable clubs forever, Poetry for Neanderthals keeps the dream alive with a much simpler, more approachable party game. Pandemic Rapid Response is another great real-time co-op set on an aeroplane. You're trying to prepare and deliver aid like water and medicine across the world. 
And I like that you're taking turns in this one because it encourages more discussion as the other players help you decide what to do, but as quickly as possible. It's tense and hard, but really streamlined. It was the last real-time game to leave my collection, for what it's worth. Jam Sumo is one of the best flicking games I've ever played, but apparently I just don't care about flicking games because I didn't feel the need to keep this one. I love the handmade wooden board. It's exactly how I want dexterity games to look. And it combines two games, one in which you're trying to get your dice down the hole, and the other in which you're trying to survive on the board while eliminating everyone else. Ultimately, it's a skill game, like playing pool, and I've never been that fussed about playing pool. If I need entertainment in a pub, I'd play Who Wants to Be a Millionaire on the quiz machine. Stinker is a great alternative to Cards Against Humanity that puts you in the driving seat by letting you write your responses, but you write them with Scrabble tiles. And I just don't feel the desire to play this kind of game anymore. The limitation of the tiles can stifle the creativity a bit, which is a pro and a con, and the box was too big for a party game. My favourite game like this was Stipulations, which I sadly lent to someone and never got back. Those were the 100 games that left my collection. If you're interested in any of the alternatives I've mentioned, I've put links to my videos and where you can buy them in the description below. If you like this video, please subscribe to the channel or become a patron to help me make more videos. I'm John Perkis, thanks for watching. <laughs>